I've got bad soil. I mean, it's not just hard compacted clay. My soil is garbage. And I'm not over exaggerating when I say that. I literally have got garbage, trash in my soil. And I'm all for no-till if you have good soil to start with, but you know, my response to don't till it, you'll, you till it, you'll kill it is if it's already dead, go right ahead. Because when you've got trash like this, that's just scattered all about the top of your soil. And I mean, everything from plastic bottles to styrofoam to broken beer bottle glass, rusted nails, and you go down another six to eight inches and you're pulling out everything from dirty old cigarette lighters to a rusted out old tape measure, plastic bottles. I mean, look at this thing. Looks like a construction site cow patty that someone just decided, eh, we got all this extra cement, just dump it over there, who cares? I mean, I hate to say it, but I've got to, I've got to till. I have to double dig. I don't have a choice. I don't want to grow with all this garbage in my land. Now again, this probably seems like I'm splitting hairs given the fact that I've got such a huge amount of garbage that I've pulled out of this soil. I mean, it wasn't just broken glass and empty plastic bottles. I found full-size fluorescent light bulbs right over there, over there, <laughs> in the perimeter of the bamboo palms that I have on this property. That carries mercury in it. Luckily they were intact and not broken, but not what you want in your soil. And so double digging it is. I chose to, after roughing up the bottom of my dugout area, I went with sand because it was already on my property and it was free. Uh, this is gonna give me a chance to not only set up a nutrient channel, but also to a certain degree, kind of like a water filter. Because in addition to the sand, I'm going to add a very slight amount of wood charcoal. Yes, you heard me right, wood charcoal. This is not biochar. This is dry wood charcoal. Now, I want you to hold that thought because I know you're thinking to yourself, hey man, the title of this video is Mycorrhiza plus Biochar equals double good, right? Well, here's why I'm bringing this up. I'm inoculating it with LAB. This has not been charged, but this is just giving it a simple inoculation of an acidic input from Korean Natural Farming. After that, because I didn't have any, um, I didn't have any uh, composted materials at the time, I went with just some dry leaf materials because those were in great abundance in my area. Hit it one more time with the lactic acid bacteria. Just give it a good soak. Once that's done, you go ahead and you add, this is my choice, or input of choice. This is organic coconut core that I brought with me from the United States. Now, I specify it that way because coconut core has a tendency to include trichoderma. This does not. It is organic certified by Omri from the US not to have trichoderma. And as you can see, I'm just once again hitting it with some lactic acid bacteria just giving it a good wetting and then you're done. You're all set, you're ready to backfill your hole. And once you get everything, just you know, kind of peek it a little bit towards the center and then after you're done backfilling, get yourself a rake and just go ahead and rake it smooth. Um, this will help you fill in some of the air gaps and some of the corners of the, of the dugout areas in addition to the center. Just, just smooth it over and then you can go ahead and water it down, let it rest for a few days and, and you're done. Your planting spot is ready to go. Now, I did this for four different spots because I have four different fruit trees I need to get in the ground. I'm in a race against time, but uh, this was just a really easy dig. It wasn't anything difficult. So we already have our wood charcoal on the ground, and now this is the accommodating amendments of mycorrhiza and a beneficial bacteria known as azos. These are from Extreme Gardens, hashtag not sponsored. But this is a really powerful one-two punch that you can use in the planting hole of any plant, be it a tree or plant, it doesn't matter. So it's the perfect combination, right? Like peanut butter and jelly, steak and eggs, like walking down the road and dropping your chocolate bar into some other random stranger's half-eaten open jar of peanut butter. <laughs> As if. No, but seriously, it's the perfect pairing, right? No, potentially not. And here's why I say that. And so a couple of years ago, I started to look into the possibilities of combining biochar with mycorrhiza, and much to my surprise, I really couldn't find a whole lot on it. Um, that was until I came across this. And let me tell you something, this was a gold mine of a discovery. This was a series of talks given by the AGU at their fall meeting in December of 2014. It was, it was really specifically focused on biochar, but in particular, there were two conversations that really caught my attention. The first one here was the from laboratory mechanisms through the greenhouse to the field trials. And this is where they actually discuss the fact that biochar and mycorrhiza are really not good together. 
Um, you can pause if you want to read this, but I'm going to put the links down in the description below. But basically what they came to was a decision that what typically is a symbiont, mycorrhiza, gets turned into a pathogen. And then the second one here, this gentleman speaks about the, the, um, the ability of biochar to be able to really uptake a lot of heavy metals, but he also speaks in particular terms of how fungi is more predominant amongst biochar when you have it in low percentages by volume. And that is why I only use a very, very small amount of wood charcoal. But back to that first conversation piece, I would have to say it's anything but definitive at this point. Now, here's the thing. Even as the researcher was indicating, this was a limited trial, four weeks, using sorghum, and who knows what kind of soil they were using. They had field, a pot trial, greenhouse yeah. trial, but it's not definitive. So, I mean, if I've got heavy clay and you might have loamy sand, is it going to be the same thing? Possibly not. Now, guys, look, I'm not an ag researcher. I'm not an ag scientist. I'm just a, a hobbyist. I'm a, I'm a home gardener. But I think there's enough evidence to show, if you just read through it, that there's some reason for concern about combining the two. That being said, there's also many variables involved that could have dictated the way that these trials ran. The type of soil, the climate, the water that was used, the type of biochar, what feedstock was used. Too many variables to definitively say the two together are bad. So not to get hung up on a lot of these details, the sciencey stuff, I'm gonna put a link down in the description below of all the things that I'm referencing here for you to be able to take a look at and decide for yourself. But again, you know, there's so many variables involved. There's no way to say definitively that using biochar with mycorrhiza is a bad thing. But in my particular situation, the reason I'm doing it this way is very specific. And here's why. So after the presentations from the HEU, I decided that what I wanted to do was to put biochar down six to eight inches in a remediated area, which is what you see me do right here. Backfill after you put your nutrient channel in place, and then it's time to plant. And specifically, the fruit trees that I'm putting in are tropical, and they've been in pots for a very long time, and they really need to get in the ground. Now, I'm very, very carefully digging the hole for this first tree. I do not want to pierce into the nutrient channel. That's why I'm being really careful here in my digging process. Um, the whole idea here is to keep the biochar and the mycorrhiza separated. That's all you got to do. I mean, the pot trials, the, the greenhouse trials, the field trials that we saw from the AGU, I have a feeling what was happening is, is that the biochar and the mycorrhiza were at the same level in the soil. That's not going to happen here. And as you can see, this hole is not very deep and that's on purpose. I'm going to be planting high. But first thing I'm doing is I'm putting in some black leaf mold, which I love to do when I'm planting a fruit tree. It's a really nice start for the fruit tree as far as nutrient goes. But now it's time for the stars of the show. First, Azos. The Azos bacteria really, really aids in transplant shock. It's going to help your tree or your plant just get used to its new home, its new permanent home. Um, it just lessens the transplant shock. But now it's also time for the real star of the show, mycorrhiza. And the black leaf mold is pretty damp, so just you know, spread it around. Make sure you get it really well on the bottom and on the sides. Just a good dusting, and you know, you're ready to go. It's time to plant your tree. Now, unfortunately, these two had been in a plastic pot for about a year and a half. Um, they came up together. They were grown from seed. A lady that I used to know in one of my other uh, areas of town gave them to me, and I was very surprised they even came up. But as you can see, they're they're pretty uh, they're pretty worn. They they've uh, They've had the worst of it for a while, but one of the things I was happy about when I opened up the pot was they're not root bound. This was really good news because I was hoping I was going to be able to split them in two and not have to plant them together. And so that's exactly what I did. But just after expecting, inspecting the whole perimeter of the, of the pot and seeing that there were no roots you know, protruding from the sides here, I just decided I'm going to go ahead and split these in two. So I got out a handsaw and just went right down the middle with them and very easily separated them out. Now, down towards the bottom, they were a bit more, you know, a little more commingled with the root system, but that's because they were sitting on hard, flat ground. Um, but again, just, I took my handsaw, I split it in half, and it, it really wasn't, uh, it wasn't that bad. Those roots will grow back. But now I've got two sour soft trees that are ready to be planted, and they definitely need to be. Uh, this little girl here is the one that took the worst of it because she just did not get enough water in the process of the time that I was moving to this new home. And as you can see, there's a lot of like just dead bare wood at the top. 
But now I'm giving her the best chance I can with mycorrhiza and azos. The nutrient channel is a good, you know, four or five inches still below. And what you want to do when you're planting in clay, and Paul Gauchi, one of my heroes, will definitely tell you this, you want to plant high. You don't want to bury the root flare. That's where the roots actually start to form at the trunk. That's the root flare. The root ball, further down, you definitely want to make sure it's covered. But in this case, you just want to mound it up, not burying the root flare, and then just make sure that you water it in really good and deep. Now, you're not going to see it in this particular clip, but this whole area that I did the remediation work on, I saturated this whole thing. Just wanted to get the top level soil damp to begin with and then, you know, let the hose run directly on the tree for about a good hour. When I was finished, this whole area was completely saturated. And the same thing was done also with her, um, with her twin in another planting spot that I had for her. But I just let the water run here and, like I said, for about a good hour. And then I took her sister over to another spot that I had her set up for, did the very same thing, just wetted the whole area down, let the water run in there for about a good hour, and they were ready to go. But, I mean, these guys really took a beating. All of my fruit trees did. They took a really bad beating because they were just in pots for too long. And so I was really concerned that, you know, they weren't even going to work. I mean, here's the little one you can see. I mean, I had to cut out the center all the way down almost to the base of the trunk. But, you know, what they say, the proof is in the pudding. And here we are a couple months later on the 4th of May, 2021. And she is beautiful. Putting out all kinds of new green growth looking really healthy, I would have to say that the separation of the wood charcoal and the, and the mycorrhiza has worked. The mycorrhiza is doing its job. She's looking really good. She's going to be small, but I want her small. And here's her sister, looking just as beautiful, a little bit taller, obviously, but she's also very small. And this is the way I want to keep them because it'll be easier for me to harvest from them later on, especially with these red mulberry trees. <laughs> One of my buddies, David the Good, will tell you, big fruit trees are good for nothing but feeding birds not feeding people. So keep your fruit trees small, a lot easier to harvest from. But the real proof in the pudding, this here is an avocado tree. I planted this back in November of 2020 and she is beautiful and happy using the same remediation method. And you know, she's looking really good, taking on really good green growth. Thanks for joining me today, everybody. I hope you'll subscribe to my channel. Please like and share this video, and if you haven't already, hit the bell notification icon as well so that you can be alerted when I upload new content. Until next time, you all take care. Bye for now.